Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Ray from the Bloomfield Public Library. We're excited tonight to have M. Sauter um, present to us Around the World in 80 Beers. All yours, M. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is M. Sauter. Um, I'm going to go through who I am and, and a little bit. Let me share my screen and that's my presentation. So get ready. If, um, if you want to uh, get a beer, have a beer. If not, that's fine. This is this is a no judgment zone. Um, I have a beer, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, it's delicious. All right, let me share my screen. Give me one second. Um, all right, can everyone see this? How are you, Sarah? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. Wonderful. Um, all right, so hello everyone. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the world of beer. Uh, the world of beer is incredibly diverse, manic, uh, interesting, wild, all sorts of stuff. So uh, we'll get right into it. Uh, this is an illustrated guide. I am a cartoonist and that is my full-time job, which is awesome. Um, I really, really love to draw. I've been drawing my whole life um, and now it is my full-time job and that just makes me super happy, so. That's me. I'm M. Sauter. That's my little cartoon. Uh, we're going to go on a journey together. and We're going to be talking about um, delicious beers and the world of beer. Um, I have a degree from the Center for Cartoon Studies. Uh, I have an MFA in cartooning. That is a real, uh, real place, um, which is insane. Um, give me one second. There we go. Um, in Vermont, St. White River Junction, Vermont. Uh, so I have an MFA in cartooning. I graduated there in 2011, and that's where I started Pints and Panels. Um, that was about 11 years ago. Pints and Panels focuses on visual beer education. So stuff like this. So I do beer and food pairings. Uh, Munich Dunkel is one of my favorite beers, a dark lager. I love dark lagers. Everyone should be drinking dark lagers. They need to be more popular. <laughs> um, so I do beer and food pairings. I do, um, this is another dark lager. A porter can be a lager. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we do, I do beer flavor simple. I do a bunch of other stuff. Um, hop varieties, what's a hop? Where does it come from? What's a flavor? Uh, beer is in, uh, four ingredients. So we've got hops, which flavor the beer. It's also preservative and we'll get into that in a little bit. We have malt, which is the soul of the beer. That's where the color comes from. Um, and then you have water. Water is 95% of the beer and you have yeast. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. I do a monthly comic about cats for a website in the UK called Pellicle about brewery cats, which I still can't believe they let me draw, uh, called The Adventures of Nelson and Goldie. I also do a magic school bus style cartoon for Vine Pair, which is a drinks magazine um, called Ale Academy, uh, which features Janine Clark. Uh, that she's the professor and she teaches her students about the world of beer styles. I did write a book, uh, Beers for Everyone of Drinking Age. It was published in 2017 uh, by a Japanese company. And I have a second book coming out in April of next year called Hooray for Craft Beer, which we published by Brewers Publications. I also work part-time at Fox Farm, which is a brewery in Salem, Connecticut. Uh, I am drinking their Czech dark lager, which I badgered their owner to make until he did. And uh, yeah, so cheers. And I'm really looking forward to talking about beer with you guys. So first things first, let's talk about the history of beer. Beer is one of the oldest beverages in the world. People have been imbibing beer for millennia. Uh, it's a vital part of most beer, uh, beer cultures. It's a very vital part of a lot of ancient cultures. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, China was one of the first places where they discovered beer and you're like, well, but that's rice. No, rice is a fermentable sugar. Um, rice can be made into beer. When we talk about sake, and I will get into this, sake is not a wine, it's a beer. Um, because when you expose starches to sugar and let them set, um, like what beer does, that is beer. When you ferment a fruit, that is wine. So like grapes, uh, cider, essentially, uh, any kind of fermented fruit where nothing is added and the yeast just goes to town on the sugars. The first big beer culture, so China created beer, or I think create beer, but it's one of the first places. So tens of like about seven, 8,000 years ago, they discovered pots, 
from that time period that have what is beer it's like rice mixed with malt and like a bunch of other stuff so it's pretty wild how they were drinking beer back then but the first real beer like geek society starts in the fertile crescent it starts with the sumerians um no one really knows how beer became um part of their culture um, but one of the reasons we what we do know is nomadic tribes stopped being nomadic and grew grain so they could make beer and bread but mostly beer um no one really knows how beer was discovered i kind of like to think that it's like two dudes being like ew try this no you try this and then they try it and they're like oh my gosh this is the greatest thing i've ever had in my life <laughs> let's not you know be nomads and let's make malt like make grain so we can uh, brew beer and that's essentially how uh the sumerian culture you know that's how nomadic tribes and then particularly the sumerians and the egyptians which i'll get to in a second became beer huge beer geeks so like I said before, like sake, starch that gets converted into sugar plus time equals beer. Um, yeast is an incredible component of beer, but back then they didn't know that yeast exists. They would call it, in the Middle Ages, I believe they called it God is good, which is one word, because they thought God was thanking them and for you know living good lives, and they created the beer. It was actually micro you know, organisms uh, that are in the air. You're breathing yeast right now. There's yeast on your clothing, don't freak out. They're good. Uh, there's yeast everywhere. So when you leave out sugared water or like when you leave cider, apple juice out that hasn't been pasteurized and it can start to turn. Um, that's one of the main things about like that's wine. But like when you have beer and you have, let's say, malted grains or bread and you leave it soaking in water and you leave it for a few days, it can be it can naturally ferment. So that's what that is. So by 3000 BC, Sumerians have culture they have laws they have one of the they have the first taxation systems in recorded history those taxation laws are for beer uh how much a, ta a tavern could serve uh beer styles they have different beer styles they have a diet beer they have a dark beer they have a light beer um they've got everything it's almost similar to like today beer is incredibly important part of their lifestyle just as beer is an incredibly important part of a lot of cultures, not just in America, but mostly like Germans, the Czechs, it's incredibly important to the, the Belgians, their lifestyle. So how does beer uh, evolve? You've got the availability of local ingredients. Can I brew with this? Um, can I, you know, add flavoring to it? Taste in beer, let's say, you know, we've got the most, you know, popular beer right now is we've got American light lagers and whatnot, um, but those develop over time from other ways like pilsners and we'll get to that later and then colonialism um, beers in india are quite popular because of british influence in their um, country um, the brits came over to america and you know they had you know availability of local ingredients and then they brought their own brewing methods and how do you use the things you have to brew beer so colonialism is a huge driver a huge huge driver of beer styles uh, especially in um, with British influence. So the Sumerian beer uh, is brewed using a bread. So they would bake with this bread twice and it's called bat beer and they still make it. I mean, Egyptians make it as well. Uh, and then you let it soak in water and the bread it is, you've heated it enough where it's turned sugary because malt can, you break open the malt, you turn it into sugar. It turns into sugar at a certain time or a certain, um, excuse me, words. Need a sip of beer, hold on. Temperature, there we go, temperature. So you take the bat beer, you soak it, and then the way you, and then you let it ferment. And then the way you drink it is you drink it out of a straw. So the grain and the yeast are at the bottom of that cup and you don't want that sediment. That's, you know, no one wants that. And so you use a special reed to drink out of it. And the Egyptians did that as well. Um, some of the flavorings that they used in Sumerian times were grapes, just as a flavoring they would use um, for more sugar so they could get higher alcohol. Um, sugar turns into alcohol. You have honey and then saffron. So it's almost kind of this like mead, wine, beer hybrid. Um, that was a very popular, they also used rose petals, pistachios, um, if you go to a beer bar or a brewery today and you see a beer that's brewed with like Skittles, 
or donuts or you know something wild or peanut butter um they were brewing with weird stuff back then they do it now too and that was four thousand years ago five thousand years ago uh egyptians were also very obsessed with uh beer that was called hect and they used the straw filtration device as well um there's, I know it made the news recently, I think a couple of years ago, where they discovered uh, in essentially industrial sized um, beer breweries where, um, you know, they would make, it could make, this one brewery could make enough to fill, you know, to give everyone and like giant stadium a pint, you know, and these are huge facilities because beer was incredibly important. Beer was used as payment. Beer was used to, um, you know, Pharaohs were buried with beer. There were breweries just to brew prayer beer that no one drank and they just put it in the, the pyramid. I mean, it's wild how important beer was to the Egyptians. That's a whole talk into itself. Before we get into individual history, it's really interesting how geography plays a role in what people drink. So this map has three different colors. So the red is for um, cultures and countries that are more wine prone. So you've got uh, France, Italy, a um, bunch of other countries, you know, those Spain and the Iberian Peninsula, because the geography and the climate, that's what they have. Then you have beer countries, countries that drink a lot of beer, um, are good for brewing, you know, or growing malt. Germany grows a lot of malt. You have parts of Poland, the Czech Republic, um, Belgium, obviously Ireland and the UK. And then the blue is for spirits, so vodka. Um, another, um, another like Aquavit up, up in Scandinavia and stuff like that, where spirits are the dominant part. That's not actually like, you know, it's not super cut and dry. Obviously, you know, the Germans make wine um, and the French, you know, the British make wine and there's beer in Russia and there's vodka and our grappa in, in Italy. So, but it's the dominant, like what is important to these cultures and beer is the gold part. That beer is the thing that's very important to these people. So the fun, also cool part about beer is that throughout most of, the, of history until the industrial revolution, beer was brewed by women. Um, Egyptians, actually Egyptians, men and women brewed side by side. Um, but in Germany, the Mayans uh, in pre-Columbian Mexico and the Americas, um, Sumerians, uh, brewing was um, a women's work because it, when it gets into the Middle Ages, it gets more into like housework um, and beer is just kind of brewed. It's a, it's a chore you do because you need beer um, because you don't really want it. Sometimes you can't really drink the water. So you're making beer, beer is better to, to, they didn't really figure out that when you make beer, you boil it um, and you're actually killing everything. So it's a very safe beverage. So everybody was drinking beer because it was the thing to drink. You could drink water. It wasn't like they weren't drinking water, um, but that's one of the main reasons. So women until about the 18th century were the dominant. It was a great way for women to make money and I'll get to that in a second. So back then what's beer like? So the technology to brew beer is, um, doesn't really exist. So you've got, you're making malt, by using a direct fire. So the malt, it's gonna be smoky. You don't really have, you're using the yeast from the air um, or what you've kind of, what lands really in your in your cauldron essentially. So it's gonna be sour. Uh, beer's not sour now because there's enough microbiology to kind of suss out the bad yeast. Uh, and it's dark because again, the direct fire and you're heating it underneath with fire uh, and that's gonna caramelize the beer. So that's kind of the beer that everybody drank. There was obviously different types of beer and there was oak aging and all this stuff, but the regular stuff you got, that's the, those are the three things that until technology comes around, that's what people were drinking. Technology really changes by like the 18th century into the 19th century with the invention of indirect kilns. So you can create malt that's lighter in color, hence lighter beers. Um, the thermometer shows up. So they actually know you know, what temperature they're fermenting at uh, until about like the what late 18th century, early 18th century, they had no idea. It was just a lot of guesswork and, you know, quality control. And then the hydrometer, which measures the amount of sugar in beer. So they could actually figure out how strong the beer was. Um, back then, it was all, also a guessing game. You had no idea what the alcohol was. So that could be, that could be a surprise. Um, all right. I'm gonna take a sip of beer and we're about to go on a journey. So I'm doing it by countries. 
again, the journey is a little manic. Um, it's going to be um, a little crazy. Um, so, but we're going to have a good time and I'm really, really uh, looking forward to it. So let's, let's go. Let me take a sip and then we can talk about England. So English and the Irish, they've been drinking beer for uh, actually probably well over millennia as far as um, you have the Celt and ancient, ancient, even Iron Age and Bronze Age cultures, the Picts, um, the Celts uh, were all drinking um, and all the tribes were big, big beer geeks. They were obsessed with beer. It was really important to their cultures. Um, it was a delicious thing that they could make. Um, this was before hops. Hops don't show up in beer until about, uh, in England, they don't show up till the 14th century. Um, they were actually banned by Henry VIII. Um, the English thought that hops in beer made you ruddy, you know, when you drink too much and you get kind of flush. Um, they thought it would make you look ruddy like the Dutch. <laughs> um, so they really didn't, which is absolutely not true. Hops are really good. Actually, hops are great for um, medicinal purposes, uh, insomnia, uh, stomach ailments and whatnot. Um, so the they, hops didn't show up in England until the you know 13th, 14th centuries. So what they would brew with is they would brew with um, a blend of spices and the, the picks and the Celts are brewing with like yarrow, mugwort, heather, henbane, things that, you know, things that were, could be like psychotropic. So there was a lot of, you know, beer that could like, you know, it wasn't just beer. It was making you know, also kind of a little loopy as well. Um, that was an important part of their culture. Um, in the middle ages, the woman brewed, uh, she was an alewife and she would have her ale stick, her ale wand rather, um, she would use that to stir the beer and actually yeast and beer would get stuck on it. And it was a way to propagate the next batch with yeast, uh, which is really fascinating. Uh, and then in the entryway, when the beer was for sale, you'd put it in the door frame. Um, there's a lot of talk about how uh, with the broom, it makes ale, our, our ale wives are they witches, but there really isn't any kind of connection. There's some articles, there's a really good article in the Smithsonian about that. Um, but there really is no connection. They just have a broom because it was easy to stir the beer. Um, and then, you know, things get out of hand or whatever. Um, but it was one of the only ways that women could make an income. So if your husband had passed or was sick, uh, it was a great way for you in the town to make some extra loot. Um, in the um, Middle Ages and later times, when you had um, the manor house, everyone drank the same beer. So the manor is where the Lord lives. But the, from the Lord to the serf, to the servant, everyone drank the same beer, um, made usually probably calling a party guile system, which is actually a really great technique where you brew one beer, then you use the same malt to brew a second smaller batch. So the first batch is probably used to store, it was called an October beer, which would have more sugar, higher alcohol. Um, you would put that aside and then you would run the second batch and that would be the small beer, lower alcohol. It would be for everyone and everybody drank the same beer. So it was kind of a, you know, one beers for everyone kind of thing. Every, you know, the Lord didn't get the fancy beer all the time. Everybody drank the same beer. Um, in the 18th century is the uh, creation of Porter. Porter is a dark beer beloved by the porters, the people who carried all the stuff, essentially like the UPS men of the day. Um, they drank thousands and thousands and millions and millions of, of barrels of porter. Um, porter was the first beer that was aged just at the brewery and then sold to be fit to sell. So what they used to do is, and they still do it now, uh, they would send out a beer that was still fermenting and then the bar was in charge of deciding when it was time to sell. They do that now in uh, England now with a cask. If you have cask beer that kind of, everyone says that warm flat beer, but it is definitely not either of those things. Um, Porter was the first beer that was sent to the pub and was ready to go. Um, it was kind of, it changed the game. Um, breweries were built that were millions upon millions of barrels. It was the, one of the first industrialized um, things in England. Um, their vats were gigantic. Uh, there's a vat or a vat, essentially a, a storing unit um, or like a barrel. There is a vat of beer that's now a concert hall in England. Uh, that's a tr that's true. So just think about how large they were to slake the thirst of the English people with porter. 
um, Porter was very, very popular until about the middle of the 19th century when there was a new style. And this new style is actually quite popular now in America, the IPA. So boats would go to uh, India, they would come back with goods and, you know, spices and all sorts of stuff. But then they had the empty boat going back. So breweries would pay the East, East India Company and other, mostly the East India Company to send the beer to homesick Britons, um, which they loved. And by the time it got there, it was filtered. It took about four to six months. So by the time the rocking of the boat, the beer filtered out, everything kind of dropped to the bottom of the barrel. It was really hot, hoppy because they would stuff the beer with hops because hops are a preservative. Um, and it was quite refreshing and very carbonated because the beer had sat for so long. Um, the English were like, that sounds great. Can we have that? Uh, because you could only get it in India. And so um, breweries started making it, especially in Burton-on-Trent, if you've ever had Bass Ale. Bass is one of the like big IPA. Now, I mean, it's an English pale ale now, but they were kind of the first that really like took off with um, IPAs and more bitter beers in England. And by 1842, it was a huge success uh, and stayed that way until about the early 20th century. That time, beer, they go to war. Uh, so you really can't, they need uh, barley or what well, we're talking about war in like 18 or 1914 or they were in some other stuff too. They were always, those Brits always had their hands in something. Um, so barley and wheat kind of get pushed to use for not beer, but other things and for the war effort. So, and then with the term of marketing as well, um, the oatmeal stout is brewed for older people and, you know, people who are sick. Um, Bass makes the red triangle, which is very popular. We still have it today is the first trademarked image ever. Um, and advertising really pushes beer into new limits. Um, everyone knows that Guinness is good for you, um, you know, or Guinness for strength. And those were very popular things in the early 20th century. So when beer starts getting marketed um, and using other ingredients and not beer or not, you know, less so with barley and, and wheat and more with like oats and brewing with sugar as well. Um, sugar is 100% fermentable. Um, so a lot of breweries in Britain, Britain and Belgium brew with sugar. There's nothing wrong with brewing with sugar. Everyone in, in uh, Coors is brewed with corn sugar here in America. Um, there's nothing wrong with sugar. So, um, what's a UK beer like now? Um, well with the war effort, so lower alcohol stuff, um, takes over the market because barley is rationed, wheat is rationed. Uh, or made illegal. They weren't allowed to brew with wheat because they needed it for bread. Um, and they start taxing beers that are higher. A higher alcohol means more taxation, more expense. So lower alcohol beers, sessionable using UK malt and UK hops, hops like Fuggle uh, that grow in Kent, so southeast of London, uh, or East Kent Golding are become quite popular. Um, I mentioned this about the warm flat beer. Um, they um, dispense it through real ale. So the beer is fermenting, it's in a cask. Um, the publican decides when it's time to serve it, they tap it, uh, open it to the air. So like, see that little, like, met, like that little wood spile in the top, they pull that out when it's served and air gets in it. So you gotta serve it within like a day or two because if you don't clear it out, it starts to turn. Um, I've only had real ale once in my entire life and it was at an inn in Scotland and it was bad because the beer had sat for too long. So it was starting to get sour um, because there's bacteria in the air and they start feasting on the beer because the beer's delicious and full of sugar. Uh, but it was the first time I had ever had real ale. So I was like, oh my God, bad real ale. <laughs> it's terrible, <laughs> but this is great. I was very excited just to have real ale. We don't have this in America um, or we do, but it's very, 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 very difficult to find. Um, it's served through a beer engine. You take your hand and pull down and your strength pulls the beer into the glass. Uh, it's, yeah, you, I've never been to England. I've only been to Scotland, um, but I highly recommend going to see this beer engine or even watching some YouTube videos about um, cast culture. It could be a whole talk into itself. Um, all right, let's cross, um, cross over into Ireland. Why does Dublin brew dry Irish stouts? So Arthur Guinness was a porter brewer actually in 1759 when he started Guinness. 
um, a stout back then was a term for a strong, so a stout porter was just a higher alcohol version of a porter. Um, style evolution, they started using unmalted barley, which you just take barley and throw it in a drum roaster and basically like burn the living crap out of it. <laughs> Excuse my French. Um, that's kind of, if you've ever had a Guinness and it's got that kind of charcoal acrid flavor, um, that's one of the reasons why um, Guinness tastes that way is because they created their own ingredients essentially to create this dry Irish stout. Um, they also invented the nitro tap, um, which is in the 1950s. So if you've ever had a Guinness, it's got that creaminess. Uh, it's because it uses ni um, majority nitrogen and nitrogen doesn't, nitrogen wants to go in the air. It doesn't want to stay in the beer. So it kind of creates this creaminess. Um, it's supposed to mimic real ale. So if you have good real ale, it's supposed to have this kind of like soft carbonation and nitro in the fifties, it came out in like the early sixties, um, kind of mimic that. So they didn't have to deal with publicans thinking if it's good or not and having bad beer and whatnot. Um, Guinness also, Dublin has very, um, their water has a lot of calcium carbonate in it, which creates a sweeter beer. So calcium carbonate's in the water. Um, it creates a sweeter calcium carbonate, creates the illusion of like sweetness and a fuller palate. So it's one of the reasons why the dry Irish stout really works well in Dublin because of that, the water chemistry that they have. Water chemistry plays a huge role in beer culture and we'll get to that. Um, let me take a sip of beer and then we're gonna go to Belgium because Belgium's style of beer is completely different than the UK. So when you're looking at Belgium, Belgium is a small country, you split it into two. Um, you split it into Wallonia, which is the French speaking Southern part. And then in Brussels, they speak French. And then the Northern part is Flemish. They speak Flemish, which essentially is Dutch. There's very few, you can use like a Dutch translation, like on Google translate and they get you, they know what you're talking about. Um, back in the day in the farmhouse, um, Belgians and the farm. So this is in Southern, uh, or Southern Belgium, excuse me. Um, they would hire saisonaires or seasonal workers, like migrant workers to go and work the fields and they would pay them in beer. Um, the saisonaires were, we would drink this beer that was brewed essentially with whatever was in the farmhouse, um, oat, spelt, wheat barley, anything, um, you would ferment it and you would ferment it quite warm, 70 degrees plus. Um, so it would create, when you brew warmer and you have the yeast to do it, uh, warmer fermentations create more off product, like byproducts. Um, what those byproducts are, are esters and phenols. Esters are very fruity. It's a fruity byproduct. So if you've ever had like Runt's candy, uh, that's flavored with isoamyl acetate. That's a banana. Um, there are yeasts that can make that flavor uh, or phenols. Um, if you've ever had like bubble gum, bubble gum has this four vinyl glycol flavoring in its clove. Um, so if you drink these Saison's now, they have those flavors in it. You have this like banana and clove, most like white pepper. Uh, they can be any alcohol, they can be any color. Um, Saison's quite a very popular beer in America now, but also in Southern, um, in Southern Belgium. They're called, also called farmhouse ales. Um, farmhouse ales, it's a, that's a loaded thing though, because that could be sour. It's, there's also a whole other talk in itself, isn't it? Um, another beer brewed in Eastern France is Beer de Garde, uh, which is kind of the same thing as uh, Cezanne, less esters or same amount of esters, less phenol. So it's not as spicy. Um, and then it was, Beer de garde means beer to keep in French. So it could be lagered. Um, the difference between an ale and a lager, and I should put a slide in here about that. Um, an ale is, it's just time, temperature and yeast strain. Ales are fermented with a yeast called uh, Saccharomyces pastor, uh, excuse me, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, fermented quicker and hotter. Lagers are fermented with a yeast strain called Saccharomyces pastorianus. Uh, because of Louis Pasteur, he did so much work for the beer industry. Um, he created, he discovered beer infection. I mean, he's a huge beer person. Uh, we have a lot to thank. Uh, the beer industry has a lot to thank for him. Um, fermented colder, about 50 degrees or so. And then lagered, lagered, German is the lager, the word to store. 
uh, and then you hold it for two weeks to months, um, this creates a cleaner beverage, so less esters, less phenols. Um, that's why the ingredients kind of shine. If you have a lager, you get more of the malt, the hops, uh, the water. Uh, whereas an ale, there's more of a fruitiness, uh, less so um, on different, um, you know, less so in the malt. You get more of this kind of like soft fruity character. Um, beer de guards are great aged. There's a great basement character. And I mean this in the great, that's everyone's like, ew, basement. Uh, they get this great basement character to them, um, this damp character, and it's actually quite good. Um, I really recommend buying, if you can find it, uh, Two Roads makes uh, Beer de Noel. It's just a Christmas, higher alcohol Christmas version of, of uh, Beer de Garde. And, um, oh, sorry, hold on. Um, that's a really good um, beer to like hold on and drink it in like May. And then you'll get this kind of basement character that's super good. Um, I really like it. So well, let's move on to Belgium and the Dutch. So the Dutch occupy Belgium and they create this stupid law in 1822 that taxes the size of the mass ton. A mass ton is the first brewing vessel where you mix the grain with the water. Um, and if you, the bigger the mass ton, the more tax you're gonna have to pay. And the, Belgian are, the Belgians go, no, we're not doing that. So what they did was they built a small one, put gears in it so they could turn it. And then, mm, excuse me, they would use a basket and pull out the malt with a basket. Um, and so they would stuff it full uh, which is a terrible idea in normal terms. Um, but it created this thing called a turbid mash because so, you're filling it with wheat and barley so much so that they're creating almost this like, it looks like a milk, this milky thing. And then you boil it for an extendedly long time. And then you leave it in a cool copper pan called a cool ship overnight. Um, that creates, uh, a, when you put it in barrels to age, that creates what is called a lambic. Um, these are very, very popular right now. Spontane it's called a spontaneous ale. You do not add yeast to this. They're, because we, there's yeast in the air, you don't add yeast to it. You just put it in a barrel and let it go. And it does. And six months later, you have this kind of sour, still beer called uh, a Lambic. Um, in Belgium, only breweries in the Seine River Valley can brew Lambic or blend Lambic. It's popular to have someone else brew it for you and then you barrel age it and, and blend it. Uh, there are blenderies in Belgium. Um, in America, you, can, you are not allowed to brew a Lambic. If you see a beer that says Lambic on it, uh, that person will get a very angry letter from Oral, which is the, the Appalachian group that protects the Lambic name. Um, we can, you, in America, we call it method traditionnel because we, can't, we are legally not allowed to, it's like champagne, uh, it's a protected word. Um, a lot of beers styles are protected in the old world, in Europe. In America, not so much. Uh, we are allowed to brew different styles, but Lambic is the one we can't, we're not allowed to call anything Lambic. So, uh, so the unblended version is called Lambic. It's served uncarbonated in a stone malt pitcher. Uh, blended versions, the one, two, and three year versions will be bottled um, and bottle conditioned, and then held for a little while longer are called Goose. They're very, very spritzy, higher alcohol, uh, very similar to champagne, it's very sour. Um, fruit is added to them um, quite frequently. Frambois is with raspberry, Creek is with cherry. Um, they are delicious. I highly rate, the one that's very popular we get in America is Lindemann's. Uh, we, that is a lambic. It's been sweetened, so it's not sour, it's still delicious. Uh, if you can get your hands on some Dre Fontenin, um, or uh, Cancion are the two really big ones. Uh, Dreyfa or Tilquin. Tilquin is a blendery. Um, Tilquin is pretty easy to find. They've gotten quite expensive now. Um, Cancion is, yeah, I've, I haven't seen Cancion in America in, oh, I don't even know how long. Uh, it's very expensive, so. Um, Belgium is also known for um, monk brewing beer, Trappist beers. Um, there's a Trappist designation, very similar to the Oral, the Lambic, that if you have to have the little, uh, I think it's a hexagon, the hexagon label on your bottle that says the, it's brewed at an abbey. It doesn't have to be brewed by a monk. Um, 
but it can be, uh, but it has to be brewed on the Abbey and then all the money goes to help um, the Abbey. Um, there are five in Belgium. There is West Flitteren, which is the one uh, in the Northwest corner. There is um, West Mall, which is the one up near the Dutch border. Then there's Chimay, Rocheford and Orval. Um, Chimay is the one on the little like spit here. Um, Rocheford is in the middle in the South and Orval is near the Luxembourg border. Um, I have been to three of them. I've been to Chimay, Orval, and West Fletcheren. They brew four types of beers, singles, doubles, triples, and quads. Uh, they're brewed for sugar. Sugar helps them dry out, which seems like a misnomer. Why would sugar help dry out? But it ferments all out, so all of it becomes dry. Um, yes, like it says, sugar ironically dries out the beer. Um, singles are meant for the monks only. Most you can't buy singles brewed uh, by Trappist breweries. It doesn't exist. Doubles is the oldest version. It's dark, about six to seven percent, kind of like this chalice here. Triples are the hoppiest, about nine percent, eight percent, and golden. And quads or Belgian strong darks are the highest alcohol, usually around 10, 11 percent, uh, and dark, basically just like a big double. Uh, Orval, it was a beautiful place. I went and there's a picture of us. There's my, yeah, me and my friends. Um, these are me and my two advanced Cicerone friends. Oh, a Cicerone is like a, a sommelier, but for beer. There are four levels. Myself and Max, the guy in the middle are advanced and our friend Shane, the smiley guy in the peacoat just passed the master. He is the 20th master Cicerone in the world. Um, there are only 25 advanced women. So I'm only of 25 advanced women uh, in the world. So uh, Max is taking his master in uh, June of, this, of next year. So, but we went to Belgium for the pandemic and it was awesome. Um, all right, let's talk about Germany. Let me take a sip of beer. All right, Germany's invented lager. So they would lager, which is German, which means to store. They would use caves. Uh, either under buildings or in the mountains, mostly in the mountains because you're in Bavaria. Bavaria is the big beer, one of like the beer centers of lager culture, Munich, you have the Alps. Uh, you brew beer in the winter, you store it in caves in the summer to keep it cold. Uh, you are legally not allowed to brew beer in the summer because it would get infected. So you would store it to lager, lagerin to store. Um, then in 1512, 1516, um, in the 1510s, the, uh, the Bavarians come up with a law called the Reinheitsgebot. Um, it means that beer can only be brewed with four things, uh, malt, uh, barley, hops, and water. Yeast gets added later because again, they don't know that yeast exists yet. They just think beer appears. Um, this becomes a fully German law after German unification. Um, but at the time, it's, uh, it's essentially the first, one of the first food safety laws. Uh, beer was making people sick. People were brewing with all sorts of stuff. Um, it could be poisonous. So the Reinheitsgebot was basically the first food safety law of its time. Uh, it also was a uh, taxation. So when you brew with these things, they're taxed at this amount. So yeah. Um, so I'm going to go quickly through, there are German, it's not just lagers, it's so many different types of beer and I'm just going to hit very quickly, hit them. Um, some of the first people that brewed beer were monks, just like in the Trappist breweries of today or in the past, uh, monks from Paul Anner, uh, they invented the Doppelbach. Um, so the funny story was during Lent, they fast, but why would God let them fast without beer? Um, so they created a higher alcohol, more malty beer, and they called it Salvator, which was to thank God um, during the Lenten season. Um, the typical style is a Doppelbach, which means Doppelbach or Strongbach. Um, and now because of the Doppelbach is still being brewed, it's still brewed by, Sal uh, by Paul Anner. Paul Anner is now a huge giant brewery uh, in Southern Germany. Uh, most Doppelbachs have an Ator um, at the end. So Spaten makes Optimator. Um, Two Roads makes Accelerator. Um, so uh, Trogues Brewery in Pennsylvania makes Troganator. So there's a lot of different, um, the Ader thing is just kind of an homage to a Doppelbach. Um, an Eisbach is a distilled version of a Doppelbach. Uh, that is illegal in America, unless you have your distillery license, you can't distill beer um, because it's taxed differently. You freeze it and then you pull the water, the ice, which, uh, 
concentrate system makes it stronger. I know two roads because they have their distilling license makes a 15% uh, ice bark. The most popular beer in Germany because of Northern Germany, because of Berlin is the German Pilsner. Uh, the German Pilsner comes into effect around the mid the 1860s. Um, and I'll get to how it becomes popular because of the Czech Pilsner, which comes first. Um, but the German Pilsner is brewed with Pilsner malt, lots of hops, it's very dry, uh, very drinkable. I highly recommend going to the liquor store and buying yourself a four pack of Bitburger. It's $5 for a four pack and uh, it's just so good. Um, let's travel over west and we'll go to Cologne where they drink Kolsch. So there's Kolsch and then I'll get to uh, Doppelbar, or excuse me, uh, Dusseldorf, we'll get to the alt beer. Uh, a Kolsch is brewed like an ale, but fermented like a lager. So it's fermented with special yeast around ale temperatures, a little colder at 60, and then it's lagered. So there's a light fruitiness. Uh, it is then served, if you go to Cologne, it's served in a glass that's only six ounces. And the glass is called Stanz. Stanz is uh, the German word for stick. So you go to a Kolsch hall, you finish your beer really quickly, and immediately there's a guy there with a krantz, which is a tray, and he just gives you another one. You don't ask for another one, they just give you another one. And they keep giving them to you until you put your coaster on the top of your glass, and then they look at all the tick marks on your coaster and they go, okay, you owe me X amount of euros. Um, Kolsch halls are a lot of fun for that reason. Um, but it's a great way to just keep drinking, and they're very easy to imbibe. It's a lower alcohol too, around 5% or so. 20 miles away in Dusseldorf, they serve essentially the same beer, but it's darker and hoppier. It's also served out of a larger stand. The stand is about 12 ounces. Um, all beers are awesome. Fox Rock, we make one called Stet, and it is really, really good. We're gonna go back down to the Bavaria and we're gonna to go to uh, have a Hefeweizen. So a Hefeweizen, if you've seen that crazy uh, vase, like that picture I've drawn, um, it's brewed with special yeast uh, and it's an ale. So it's brewed like an ale, quicker and hotter. Um, this yeast stain creates a copious amount of four vinyl quad called that clove and that isoamyl acetate, that banana. It's served in a vase. So the showcases the ample foam. The glass is also very, very tall uh, and about um, a half liter. So about 17 ounces. Um, very popular in the summer, very popular in um, German, um, like German beer, like gardens. In Leipzig, they drink Goes. A Goes is an ale, but it's brewed with salt and coriander and lactic acid. Uh, how is lactic acid um, allowed in, during, because of the Uh Malt naturally creates lactic acid. So they just brew it as is, and it just creates the sour product. Normally you would get rid of that with like rests and um, heating it up to a higher temperature, but not with this. Um, in Leipzig, that's very popular. Um, more, not really now, but Gozas are really, really popular in America. Very easy to find, um, much more sour than a Leipziger goes. If you find it in America, it's more of what we call a contemporary Goza. Great in the summer and great fruited. Um, then in Berlin, they have a Berliner Weisse. Uh, it's similar to a Goza, much more sour, um, lower in alcohol, and it's usually served, no sea salt or coriander, and it's usually served with fruited syrups. Uh, green woodruff, woodruff tastes like marshmallow. So having a marshmallow sour, it's delicious. Um, or a raspberry syrup. Um, there's a brewery in Oxford, Connecticut called OEC, and they brew an excellent Berliner Weiss, and they make their own syrups as well, so you can have it the traditional way. Um, Napoleon's army loved the Berliner Weisse. It was very popular in the 19th century. They called it the Champagne of the North. All right, back to uh, Bavaria. Well, let's talk about lagers. So what do they drink at Oktoberfest? So when we think of Oktoberfest in America, we think of an amber colored ale called, a, or excuse me, a lager called a Merzen. But actually they drink a beer called a Fest beer, which is essentially um, about a 6% lager that's golden, easier to drink, and they've been drinking that since the late 80s or so at Oktoberfest. Um, in America, if you go to an Oktoberfest, you're not going to drink a Fest beer, you're going to drink a Meriton, which is essentially the same beer, it's just darker. Um, and then you're going to drink it uh, out of a liter stein called a Maskrug or a Seidel, which is that glass with the dimples. All right, we're going to the Czech Republic, which is what I'm drinking now. And so why are Pilsner so popular? We have to go to Pilsen 
to discover this. So it's 1842 and the town of Pilsen goes, we want to brew beer just like Bavaria. So they hire a Bavarian brewer named Josef Grohl, who apparently was a real jerk. And they fired him immediately after he created the beer because he was mean. Is what I'm, Even his own father didn't like him. That's what they said. Um, and he looked at what ingredients he had in Pilsen. They had very soft water. They had uh, very pale malt and they had sauce hops. Sauce hops are kind of spicy. So he brewed with them around this time, glassware is becoming cheaper. So clear glassware becomes popular. And in the fall of 1842, the town gets to try this beer and it's crystal clear and golden color and they freak out and they think it's the greatest thing they've ever had. The town gave him a huge ovation at the St. Martin's Fair. And then other places started to go, wait, what is this beer? We want to try it. We want to make our own. That's where the German Pilsner comes in. The Kolsch comes in. Um, the, there's a bunch of other golden styles that are created because of the Pilsner. You know, we wouldn't have Bud Light if it weren't for Joseph Grohl and his Pilsner. So it's pretty fascinating to see the evolution of styles. In the Czech Republic, they use what is called a side pole to serve beer. It looks like this wacky contraption. You actually take your mug and you jam it into um, the faucet. And inside that faucet, there's a restrictor. It's almost similar to like a nitro, but there's no nitrogen. Um, and it creates all this wet foam. So if you've ever seen like these photos of Pilsner or Kellen, they have so much foam. I, I've heard stories of Americans going to the Czech Republic and being like, why are you giving me foam? I hate foam. No, they foam is great. Foam concentrates beer. It also is like a helmet, protects the beer. So when you're at a bar and you're like, no foam, you actually want foam. Foam is very important. Um, it's like a, it's a, like a protein hat essentially that the beer wears. Um, so Czech beer comes in four strength. There's the pale, which is the one most people drink. Uh, what we think of is Czech premium pale beer, the Pilsner or Kell, um, the original beer that Joseph Kroll built, uh, made. You can drink, you can go and buy it. It's at the store here. Pilsner or Kell is delicious. There's a, um, it's a little darker um, than the Czech pale. Then there's the Politamavi or amber. Politamavi is the Czech word, it means half dark. And then there's Tamave, which I'm drinking or Tserne, which means black, which is Czech dark. Uh, all are lagers, there are only lagers. Oh, all right, we're going to Poland. I told you, we're going quick, we're going quick here. Um, in Poland, they have a beer called a Grotzer, that's the German word for it. The Polish word is Grodziski. Uh, lower alcohol, 100% oak smoked wheat malt, low alcohol. They call it, and it's very carbonated, they call it Polish champagne. Uh, Alvarium, I live in New Britain, uh, Alvarium makes one. Um, not usually easy to find only one brewery in Poland makes it. And I've, it comes to America, but not Connecticut. Uh, so I've never had a Grodzisk, which is the town. So Grodziski is the town that, that it's made in, but it's made with a hundred. So it's think of it as like high alcohol and spritzy, but lower alcohol, usually 3% Fox farm. We make one and it's smoky. So it's wild. It's a wild, wild beer. Beer can be wild. Um, also in Poland, they drink, um, Baltic Porter. You've seen, if you've come to, Little Poland here in uh, New Britain, and you've seen all the Polish, the Juviets, which is the the like big big um, the big uh, brewery. Um, you can get that. It's high alcohol lager, dark. Um, it's kind of the take off of porters that were really popular in the 18th century. They would make them export strength, so they'd str make them stronger, so they could do the large long voyage, and then they would go to Russia, the Baltic states, Poland. And Poland started brewing their own using German lager technology. So you've got English porter coming to Poland, the German, the Polish who know how to brew like the Germans basically make it their own. It's like a cross between a Dabelbach and a porter. Um, the Juviets, the porter, it's $1.79 at the Roly Poly in New Britain, and it's 9.5%. It is great with stew, great on its own, great in winter. It's a phenomenal beer. They are high alcohol, so heads up. Um, Africa, the African beer, it could be a talk in itself. Um, there's a lot of home brewing that goes on in Africa. Uh, there's a lot of uh, pombe, which is the beer they brew with banana. They brew with their local ingredients, um, like millet, sorghum, banana, straws for filtration. When you look at, um, festivals and whatnot, a lot of people are drinking out of like the, like the kind of like homemade, it's, and the word we've seen that before, this like homemade like 
pottery with the straws. Oh yeah, so they've been drinking this way for <laughs> for millennia. Um, it's still the way of life uh, when you get into like rural Africa and they make their own beer. Um, obviously, they also have you know mass produced stuff. Guinness is quite popular in Africa. Um, Tuker um, is the national beer of I believe Kenya, and they are owned by Guinness. So it's it's beer is kind of everywhere um, and everyone kind of shares their own you know what what do they take from other places people come in and they teach them stuff but they still have their own traditions in japan i mentioned that sake is beer because starch and sugar plus time equals beer um, but japan has a which i've never seen before has a tax system based on the amount of malt in beer so the more expensive beer is an all malt so if you've ever bought beer like at a sushi restaurant or at a Japanese restaurant that says 100% malt, all malt. Um, that's because the beer is 100% beer. Um, a lot of what's more popular in, in Japan is called hapishu, which means bubbly alcohol, uh, lower in alcohol and more sugar, more rice, um, more less, you know, more adjuncts. Adjuncts is anything that's not malt. So coffee, you know, all that stuff, not that they're brewing with coffee. Um, so those are really, those hapishus are quite popular in Japan. Quick jump over to Australia. They love Fosters, right? Absolutely not. No one drinks Fosters in Australia. <laughs> I went to Australia and they did not see it. Um, they do not have it. Uh, it was an Australian product that's now owned by Molson. Um, and so it's made in America actually. Um, in um, um, Australia, they drink what's called an Australian pale ale. It kind of looks like if you're, if you're a beer drinker now, you know that New England IPA, um, so that hazy, so it's lower alcohol very, very dry, 4%, super, super dry. Uh, and then made with Australian hops. Australian hops have this beautiful mango and tropical. So it's just like this tropical, low alcohol. I had an Australian brewer tell me it's like when you're surfing and you're hot, it's what you reach for. Kind of like how we would reach for like a Bud Light. That's their beer and it's everywhere. They're called Pacific Ales. Um, they're really, really good. I wish they were more popular here in America. Quick jump over to Peru, how are we doing on time? Oh boy, I'm almost done. Um, so in Peru, they brew something called chicha. Um, chicha is when you take corn and you, and this is this sounds gross, but apparently it's delicious. They take corn by chewing it in their mouth and then they, the corn, the, your mouth is the mash tongue. So you chewing, you spit it into a bowl and you let that, and then you boil it and then you put it in an earthenware pot and let it ferment. Um, it's lower alcohol. It kind of tastes like hard cider. It could also be made with quinoa. Uh, I have a photo of it here because I couldn't do it justice. It's drank out of this like giant container. So it's very interesting looking, but I hear it's delicious and they have the chicharia. Um, it's made by, or chicha de ora is, it can be non-alcoholic. It can be alcoholic, uh, kind of like kombucha here in America or like kvass, which is a rye drink from Eastern Europe, can be alcoholic, can be not. Um, the chicharia is open if you kind of a lot of people, a lot of women brew it in southern Peru and they put the red flag outside their door, a red bandana, to show that the chicharia is open. But we've also seen that before. The alewife, when she would brew, would put her broom above the door. So it's so cool to see two solely separate countries and cultures use the same, almost the same, you know, ideology and whatnot for brewing, for brewing beer. It's fascinating. All right, we're at America, USA. The pilgrims landed because they ran out of beer. That is the true story. Um, they needed, the people who were gonna take the boat back needed enough beer. So they were like, well, let's land and figure out how to brew beer. And so you've got two things, you've got colonialism and then you have access to local ingredients. So, and this is about the 17th century. So they're in love with Porter. So they relied on a lot of different ingredients adapting local ingredients. They used molasses to brew their porters, pumpkin, walnuts, corn, anything they could find to brew their beer. Uh, the number one fan of porter was George Washington. George Washington was obsessed with porter. He was obsessed. He was a huge geek for the hair brewery in Philadelphia. Um, it was his favorite beer. He made sure to have it all the time. Uh, beer was incredible. They brewed beer at Monticello. Um, they brewed beer at, they brewed beer everywhere. It was a very important part until the early 20, 19th century when liquor and whiskey take over. Um, beer is a very important part of their culture. Um, in the mid 19th century, we have three men to thank for our current beer. We have Adolf Busch, or we have, uh, we have oh gosh, 
what is his first name? I thought it was Adolf. It's Adolf and Adolf Kors and Frederick Miller. Um, Adolphus, Adolphus Bush, excuse me. Then we have Adolf Kors and you have Frederick Miller, whose real name is Frederick Mueller. Um, these three men created what we know as the big three, um, Anheuser-Busch, Coors, and Miller. Miller Coors is now one company now, and Bush, uh, Anheuser-Busch is owned by a Brazilian-Belgian conglomerate uh, called InBev. So actually the largest brewery in America is Yingling, um, based out of Pennsylvania, which is also the oldest brewery. They've been around since 1829. So those three men create um, their Pilsner beers. Prohibition happens, everyone said. Um, prohibition created the three-tier system in America. So how you get, buy beer now is prohibition ends the three. So the brewery sells to a distributor and that distributor sells it to a store. This is to make sure that there's no, you know, that the, the brewery doesn't own the store, although it's very muddy now and convoluted, but that's one of the reasons why. Um, in the beer falls out of favor after prohibition, most breweries close and now you've got um, about 40 breweries left in America. Enter these three gentlemen. These are the three gentlemen that created the modern um, microbrewery movement. You have Fritz Maytag who bought um, Anchor Brewery, which is still a brewery in San Francisco, now owned by the Japanese. You have Jack McAuliffe. Jack McAuliffe created the first microbrewery, uh, which doesn't exist. It was only open for a few years, called New Albion in Sedona, California. And you have Ken Grossman. Ken Grossman created, uh, in 1979, created Sierra Nevada Brewery in Chico, California, one of the largest breweries now in America. That man is a billionaire. And he was working in a bicycle shop <laughs> when he started. Um, Beer becomes very, very popular in the 80s and 90s, and it's a huge boom, specifically in the last 10 years or so. Um, now we have about this, this, this slide only goes to 2018, but we have 2,000 more breweries. There are 9,000 breweries in America. Um, I live in New Britain. We have two breweries. I live within driving distance of 10, at least 10 breweries. So it's pretty fascinating to see the growth in the microbrewery movement, chipping away at the big guys. Um, but everyone kind of lives um, a happy life now. So what makes beer American though? So there's, there's a lot of things enabled American IPA, American Amber. Um, basically we take everything and we turn it up to 11. We use American ingredients, no adjuncts. So just all malt, American hops, higher ABV. So the difference between an English IPA, there'd be sugar in that, it'd be English ingredients. With an American IPA, it'd be all malt, higher alcohol um, for the most part and American ingredients. So what's the most popular beer in the United States? It's been Bud Light. It's been that way for 20 years. Uh, it dethroned its big brother Budweiser in 2002. But what's the most popular beer in the world? That would be Snow, CR Snow, only sold in China. Uh, I've never seen it before, uh, but it is one of the largest breweries in the world. Um, the Chinese are obsessed with beer. They're very, very, very into beer. Uh, and they have many of their own breweries that don't leave um, the Chinese mainland. Um, beer now, especially um, lighter lagers, um, are tied to place. So like when you go to a different country, you drink the country's beer. Um, and a lot of them are independent, but some are not. I'm actually not some. Most are not. Um, so if you've ever been to Nicaragua, you see Tonia. Tonia is an independent company. Um, Singa in Thailand, that is an independent company. Uh, Banks in Barbados and Guyana, um, that is like the official beer of Barbados, uh, that lager, that's an independent company. Um, they actually brew a lot of Guinness's beer for the South American market. Um, Asahi, Asahi is a gigantic company. Asahi just bought um, Bell's Brewing in Michigan. It's one of the, like the seventh largest brewery in America. Um, or no, yeah, no, that was Kieran. Sorry, Kieran Lyon um, basically own everything. So, but Asahi, oh, Asahi owns Anchor, that's who. So like everyone's kind of, the thing you'll learn when you try beer is that when you're like, oh, I like this beer, chances are not in America, but other places, it's owned by a larger entity. Uh, like Carling, Black, um, Carling Lager, the most popular beer in the United Kingdom is owned by a Canadian company, Molson Coors, who also owns Coors and Miller uh, in America. Uh, Tusker, which I talked about uh, from Kenya, is owned by Diageo. Diageo is the parent company of Guinness. Um, you, go, you go to Ukraine and you have Lvivsky. Lvivsky is owned by Carlsberg, which is a Dan the largest brewery in um, Denmark. 
uh, Peroni. Peroni is a bird, you know, when you think of Italy, you think of Peroni, it's owned by the Japanese. Um, and Jupile, which is the most popular beer in Belgium, is owned by AB InVib. They also make Stella. So it's pretty interesting to see the globalization of beer. I'm not saying it bad or worse. I'm just saying it's pretty wild how things change and are, things are owned by larger entities now, specifically beer as well. Brahma in Brazil um, is owned by AB InBev. Um, Corona is owned by AB InBev, but in America it's distributed by Constellation Brands because of uh, antitrust laws. Um, Bud Light is owned by a, you know owned by the Belgians. Um, Kingfisher in India is owned by Heineken, the Dutch. So or it's a minority stake, but still. If you gave everyone in America a beer, or everyone in the world a beer, over a quarter of them would be holding an AB product. 9% um, of them be holding a Heineken product. 6% CR is Snow, the Chinese company. 6% of them be holding a Snow. Like it's pretty interesting to see the, the, the I, I think it's really fascinating, the globalization of beer. All right, oh, we're done. Okay, I've been talking for an hour, awesome. All right, how to start your beer journey? Drink, <laughs> responsibly. Um, find out what you like, what you don't like. Go, all right, hey, I really like this beer a lot. What else is like it? It's how I discovered beer. Um, my beer journey started in 2005 when I had a wit beer, which is a Belgian style, like a white ale made with wheat and coriander um, and orange peel. And I was like, wow, I really like this. This is great. What other things are like it? And then I guess try Hefeweizen. I tried other Belgian beers. Um, I recommend going to a beer store. Um, Harvest in West Hartford, which is close to y'all, um, is a great one. They have a huge um, single shelf where you can pull stuff. Um, one of the things to look for when you're buying beer is look for a born on or best by date. There's nothing worse than old beer. Beer should be drank fresh. Um, so like this can, I mean, obviously you can't see that, but it'll say canned on. And then a lot of breweries should have a born on or a best buy. When, when can you drink this too? When was it drank? So the fresher, the better specifically for higher, not um, for hoppier stuff. So go try stuff, see what you like, you know, and never stop exploring. And that's the best part about beer is when you find something you like that you really enjoy, you'll never look back. And that's my manic hour of talking about beer. So cheers. <laughs>